Hello and welcome to this new session on Current Affairs Crash Course 2020. I welcome you all. I hope and believe that you are all well rested and fine of your homes. Right. Today we will be discussing a little bit on the current affairs related to economics. There are a lot of things that have happened over the years, and most of the topics we will be covering through a series of videos that will be uploaded as part of our current affairs crash course. Right. So today for our discussion, we are going to jump straight to the first topic. The first issue that we are going to discuss is the AGR issue, adjusted gross revenue issue. You would have been familiar about this because around the last week of October, we had this news where there were headlines in almost all newspapers which claims that telecom companies will now have to pay up to 1.47 lakh crore to the government. So why is this huge number suddenly appearing of nowhere? To understand this whole problem or the controversy behind it, we need to go back a little and understand from where is the problem emerging. To understand the origin of the problem, we have to go a little bit further to 1994 where the government came up with the national telecom policy. This national telecom policy was part of the privatization of liberalization reforms of the government where the government decided to open up the telecom sector which was until then a monopoly of the government. So how did it open up? It said, I am going to welcome anybody who is going to register or who is willing to be a telecom company but for that he has to pay a license fee. And how is this license fee going to be paid? It should be on a fixed basis which means and let's just assume it's going to be 20 crore. So there is a company A, a company B, both of them are willing and they are going to be 20 crore to the government, take the license and they are going to go with their business. The first year is over. The second year again they have to pay the fixed license fee which is 20 crore. And next year again they have to keep on paying until the government is revising this license fee. Why is this a problem? To understand if there are two companies who have got a license, why paying the license fee? Company A is successful, company B is not so successful. Company A is having a revenue of 1000 crore, but the company B is having a very meager revenue of say 100 crores only. And if for the next year also, if it has to pay 20 crore to the government and has to just have 80 crore as part of its investment plan, this is going to harm the interest of the company. And that's why it was a kind of unfair means to issue licenses of this format. So the government also recognized this problem and felt that it was because of this that many of the players were not willing to enter the telecom sector. So in 1999, it gave a new option and that was called as the revenue sharing model. So what is this revenue sharing model? So this was the answer to the problem of the license fee. So if the fixed license fee is not going to take into account the revenue generated by the firm, the company says in proportion to the revenue, pay a fee. So how is this proportion going to be? It says you have to pay 8% as license fee and 3 to 5% as spectrum usage charge every year. And what kind of revenue will be taken into account. On what revenue? So there are many revenues in the balance sheet of a company. You can find gross revenue, you can find net revenue. So net revenue is going to take into account a lot of adjustments. It's going to negate depreciation, it's going to take into account the income tax payments, it's going to take into account the debt payments. After taking into account all those items which it can exclude, it will end with something called as net revenue. But here, the telecom department has come up with a new definition called as AGR. This terminology is unique to the Department of Telecommunication Audit. It says that you have to pay 8% of fees on the basis of AGR. Where do we have the controversy or the dispute? The dispute is on the stand that is being taken by the DOT as well as the company. The company is saying that the definition that has been given by the DOT for the AGR is unfair because gross revenue 
with a cost if the accounts have an adjustment, but the adjustment gross revenue itself is fair, unfair. How is it unfair? Because it takes into account every revenue that I am earning, even through other means. Understand? I have to pay license fee, and for that I will be paying only from the revenue that I have generated through the use of the spectrum. I have been earning revenue through other means. Why should you include all those revenue? So what are those kind of revenue? For example, the company has invested 100 crore in a fixed asset, in a building it has invested, it has leased out certain land to the company, or through uh, financial assets, it could be earning certain amount of money. So all of this is included under the definition of AGR. The companies are saying, please exclude them. Make a distinction between core revenue and non-core revenue. Core revenue are those coming only from this usage of spectrum. So only upon that, charge some rate. Don't charge an in, uh, the percentage on all revenues. The Department of Telecommunications, uh, Telecommunications is refusing to budget the same. No, I have given you certain adjustments and only after the adjustments, I am demanding certain revenue. But both of them were unrelenting and they said, let's see the court. Therefore, it became a long drawn illegal decision. To understand it, we have to go to the timeline of how it happened. First, in 2005, the telecom companies represented by the COAI decided, I'm going to challenge this in the court. And to be precise, not to the court, it went to the Telecom Disputes Tribunal. Telecom Disputes Tribunal upheld the view of the COAI. They said that it is wrong for the government to charge on the basis of AGR. The government again went to the telecom, disputes appellate tribunal, right? The TD side. The TD side again proved in favor of the COI and said AGR declaration is wrong. As we know, even though it is an appellate tribunal, the final order is not final, and always the government has the option of going to the Supreme Court. So, it challenged the order of the 2015 sat in the Supreme Court and it was pending for four years. It was this order that was given in October 24, 2019. And what did the Supreme Court do? It upheld the definition of AGR according to the DOT. It said that the Department of Telecommunication order is valid. By upholding, it just didn't stop with upholding. What it did was, see, you have been disputing this figure. You have been disputing that you will not be paying on the AGR. So whatever you have not paid until now, you have to pay both including penalties and interest also. And so this order translated into a huge amount of 1.4 lakh crore for many of the telecommunication companies, including the interest and penalty. So why is this a problem? After that, so you see, in 23rd January was the deadline. It gave three months for the companies to pay. The telecom sector is already in a stress. It was unable to pay, right? From 2018 itself, due to very extensive competition, especially for the entry of geo communication. Other dominant players have been have feeling a very hard pinch on its revenue, right? Especially Vodafone, Idea, they have been facing the heat, and that's why last year they decided to merge into a new entity. And all of this is happening, and so by three months they were not able to pay. On 23rd January, which was the deadline of the, of the Supreme Court. No company was able to pay the entire amount. Just on a token basis, some of the companies paid 1000 crores, some paid 550 crores like that. So in February 26, a contempt case was paid. Contempt means failing to oblige or obey the orders of the court. And so who has actually filed this contempt case is not the government. Because government is a party involved. It was not the government who filed this case, it was just a clerk in the Supreme Court itself. So, taking this contempt case 
it said again you have to pay within a month. The companies are in no position to pay and therefore they have started to lobby for a relief from the government saying so you are the party here, you have to find a relief for us. So the, the government was working on a plan. It said that by the end of March, it will come out with some sort of arrangement. But as we know, by the mid of March, there was this problem of COVID and we have to go into a shutdown or lockdown. And before that, the Department of Telecommunication had given out a clarification that it has proposed, it has not, have been, it has not been implemented, it has not been ratified as of now, but it has proposed that it will give a 20 year repayment plan. There was a plan. This is going to be a huge relief for telecom companies. By this way, the government is making sure that it is also not losing out the revenue that is due, as well as giving a relief to the company. Right. Now, if at all the companies were forced to pay, what would be the implications? Right? So, as we discussed, major companies like Vodafone, Idea, they are all debt driven. Vodafone is nearly sitting on debt now, 55,000 crores. And nearly 9,000 crore is being exposed to the largest lender in India, the MPA. It's a crore company, again it has to pay dues to the government, where is it going to raise the plan? That's the question. Right? So as we discussed, there has been some relief by the government in the form of, even if we are not going to call that a relief, there has been, government has displayed that it is willing to give a relief to the telecom companies. If the government had not given this relief, and we do not even know if this relief is going to stand, or even if this is going to be a problem for the company or not. What are the chances is, if the third dominant player in India, that is the war of an idea, is unable to run its business, this will lead to a duopoly in the telecom market, one is add to the other issue. The other implication of this order is that, if companies are made to pay. The NPAs of banks are likely to rise because if it has become commercially unviable for companies like Vodafone to do business and they have the option of exiting the business altogether or filing for insolvency, then the NPAs of bank is likely to rise. Then one of the concerns which has been flagged by the RBI saying that now in order to pay the dues and also to generate more revenue, it will have to increase the tariff rates of cell phone or cell, uh, tariff plans of mobile plans. As a due to tariff rate increase, this can lead to further inflation in the market. This was a risk that the RBA flagged in the month of November. Right? Apart from all of this, there is a newest telecom policy. We thought telecom policy is 1994, 1994, Now we have a new telecom policy, 2018, which kind of replaces the word telecom with the word digital communication so as to widen the ambit of telecommunication scenario. Telecommunication is now touted as one of the path breakers for a new India. Because New India is going to be on the lines of Digital India, going to be further fueled and given trust by this mobile communication. And that's why it says Digital Communication Policy. Under this policy, we have two main goals. One is to attract 100 billion investments, both from domestic as well as from foreign direct investment. If you are not going to create an enabling environment for companies like Vodafone, Idea and other existing companies, how are new companies going to come and invest? And also it says this is going to be one of the major employers in the industry. So 4 million jobs can be created within 2 years. But this is also unlikely to happen if companies are allowed to pay. Right? These are some implications that we can infer from this AGR scenario. 
And not only that, to this eight year scenario, one clarification which has not from the government, not come from the government, is related to other companies which are also using spectrum. For example, pipeline companies are using their pipeline capacity to have their own digital communication. For example, ONGC, DPGL, they are also having some kind of telecom lines, especially wired lines, they are operating on their own. So, are they also to be brought under the ambit of the AGR? These are all questions that have been still unanswered. Right. Now, right, there is another implication that we have forgotten, one that is capex expenditure. The capital expenditure, already we are understanding that the fixed, fixed capital formation, fixed capital formation in India has been falling, especially due to the lack of private investment. Further, a telecom communication, which is one of the largest attractors of FDM in India over the last few years, if that is also failing, there no, there will no more be enough capital to be spent for. So this will again diminish our capacity of forming capital. Right. The next issue that we are going to discuss is the RBI's surplus transfer. This also came to around 1.45 crores or some crores, which was out there in the news, and the government had a huge windfall because of this. What is this issue about? Why should the RBI transfer this surplus? What we are going to discuss. And if you see the surplus, we have to understand the backdrop of it. The backdrop comes from the Bimal Janani Committee. So the Enna Committee. So this was not set up in this year. It was a Genesis in 2018. First of all, we should understand Younger is a surplus market. RBA younger is a surplus market. How does it earn income? One, government securities hold that. It holds a lot of government securities, especially with the old one on that. It has to sell government securities, it comes on government securities, and government securities are always going to have some sort of interest rate. So if that interest rate, it will earn a certain amount of profit. It will invest in foreign currency assets. Right, it will absorb dollars, it will absorb euros, and through that it will have some amount of profit. It will conduct open market operations. It will buy securities, it will sell securities in the market, and with this it will have some amount of profit as income. Foreign currency and gold reserves. It will also have gold reserves. For example, in 2015 it would have absorbed gold at a rate. Let's say it was 25,000 per 8 grams. Now it has become nearly 35,000. So if it is willing to sell its gold reserve, it will have a higher profit. And so without, this is unrealized. Unrealized means only at the point of selling, it will have money. Vikyalan Suna and the asset button, the balance sheet will be changing. The balance sheet of the RV will be changing. The asset and liability will be changing. But it doesn't mean that it will. It is certainly going to have a higher amount. So in the last, our load of income of our. So every year it will be earning certain amount of profit. The RBA is also a banking company. So when it is a company, to whom should it give its profit? The question. So RBA company, the company are owned by who is the owner? Hundred percent of the share of the RBA is owned by the government. So because the government is the shareholder. The RBA has to transfer all the surplus to the government. So this surplus transfer has been taking place all over the years, and it was not transferring the entire surplus. And in 2013-14, when Ranjan Rajan became the governor of RBA, he made a decision saying the entire surplus will be transferred to the government because it is the sole shareholder. Now, so where does the question of forming a separate committee to study these things occur? Here, it is about capital adequacy. So, what is the capital? See, 
it is going to transfer its surplus but before transferring its surplus it will take a certain amount of the profit that it has earned the income that it has generated over the years and it will reserve it it will not use it for any other purpose but only for contingency purposes this is called as a reserve of the rpc the problem here is how much of the reserve how much of the total asset have you segregated as your reserve is the question globally in 2016 17 if you see globally it is 16% most of the central banks across the world are having around 16% of the surplus as reserve but here in india the rb is maintaining 26.5% and year on year it is increasing Sometimes it is increasing to 27, sometimes it is increasing to 26, or decreasing 26. So there is no fixed amount that the RBI is maintaining. But as we have seen, the balance sheet of the RBI is always maintaining about 25%. Is it high? Is the question. Is it overcapitalized? Is it overcapitalized? So this is the question that has been put by the government to the RBI saying. See, you are overcapitalizing. No need to have so much amount. This is you follow amount that you have to maintain. You have to maintain a minimum of it. Adequate, you keep capital. I'm not against it. So, in order to settle this question of what is the right level of reserves, or to say is the RBI having too high, or should it be lower? In the question, like, you are the same thing there was a separate committee that was framed that was called the economic capital framework committee led by Vimal Kumar. in the committee in 2018 November Master was constituted in what was given the mandate to study these questions this report came in the month of July right July 31 in the report that is where it said you can transfer 1.76 lakhs to the government in the 1.76 lakh, 1.2 lakh is a surplus. Surplus means just the profit. And 52,000 crore is the excess provision. Excess provision. In the Kamakil and Agalu Jalana, the 26.5 percentage of reserves is written there. That is too much. So bring it down. You can bring it to some level, but it has, short, it has stopped short of deciding what should be the level. Now, you know, Quantity it has not said you have to keep 25, it has not said 22. By saying that, there is nowhere in the world, nowhere in the world do we have a practice of a central bank having a quantitative measure. See, 14 na adequate are 15 na adequate are essentially no bank is having. So every bank should be given the discretion to give maintain certain amount of pressure that it wants, but as of now. So you can bring it down. So it made changes to the provisions of the balance sheet of the RPA. And due to this, there was 52,000 crore that was as extra reserves to the RBA that had to be transferred. So in the huge amount transfer RMLA, the non-tax revenue of the government increased. Because of this, the government was able to borrow less and not allow the fiscal deficit to increase. Right. The next topic that we are going to discuss are certain monetary policy decisions that have been taken in the year 2019-20. See, every year there will be six monetary policy committees. They will be meeting twice, uh, no, uh, once uh, in two months. Now, this year there was an unusual seven monetary policy committee will come to that a bit later. But if you see throughout all the monetary policy committee, from policy, monetary policy committee one to four, in the fourth monetary policy, in the fourth, till the fourth monetary policy committee in December, and December, every time the monetary policy committee met, the RBA has been cutting the repo rate, which means it has been taking a policy of monetary expansion. Why monetary expansion? Because growth is falling, it is feeling that credit is not taking hit, and so it has to pump in more money. 
அதனால க்ரோத் குறைய குறைய யாபி வாஸ் கண்டினியூ ரெப்போர்ட்டிங் ஸோ நல்லா குறைச்சிட்டாங்க எனி ஹண்ட்ரட் அண்ட் டென் பேசிஸ் பாயிண்ட் இட் ஹஸ் ரெடியூஸ் ஓவர் த போர் குவார்டர் ஆஃப் போர் மானிட்ரி பாலிசி கமிட்டி நவ் இன் டிசம்பர் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் வீக் ஃபிஃப்டின்த் மானிட்ரி பாலிசி கமிட்டி வாஸ் அ லிட்டில் பிட் ஆஃப் ப்ராப்ளம் ஃபார் தி ஆர்பிஓ பிகாஸ் இன்ஃப்ளேஷன் வாஸ் ரைசிங் so because inflation was rising especially on account of food inflation the government was not in a position to, sorry the rbi was not in a position to bring down repo rate so it maintained status quo the status quo maintained but rather upper rate cut panla which saying that inflation varadana vaippal but the government the economy is in need of money so who is going to answer ஆர்பிஎன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் the introduction of the long term repo operation and targeted long term repo operation and some other decisions related to seventh month policy policy also first is the operation phase so the operation phase na as we all know it is related to a special unconventional open market operation open market operation is a practice of the rba coming directly to the market and selling government securities or buying government securities based on the liquidity needs of the market right so bonds government securities are either they will absorb or they will sell ab in the omo the operation twist in solra omo what the omo ke enna vyasam why is it called as operation twist one any open market operation will have either two objectives one we infuse security or absorb liquidity but operation twist in the omo was not having any of this objective it was not intended for increasing the liquidity or decreasing the liquidity in the market so what was its purpose to understand the purpose and the objective of operation twist we need to understand a little bit of basics and that is to understand what is yield curve the main objective of operation twist was to flatten the yield curve but the yield curve na enna why should it be flattened flattening means there is a deviation between the yield curve of long term and short term the yield curve near maarudhu why is there unusual deviation idella paathirukku we should understand what yield curve is the yield curve na enna theriyukiradhaaga we have to take two variables in account one is the bond yield the other is bond price so bond yield na na bond price na enna mostly bond oda yield illa price appdi associate panna matha or bond nu paatha we will normally be associating it with interest rate or bond la evlo interest rate so government treasury is a bond how much is the interest rate on the treasury bill this is what we will be interested in but the market will be stimulated by or be influenced by yield rates so what is that so how why is a statement always there that there is an inverse relation between the bond price and bond yield yeah in the inverse relation you understand this the test intuitively think of a bond price means 1000 rupees இன்னைக்கு ஒரு பாண்ட் பிரைஸ் வந்து தௌசண்ட் ருபீஸ் அது ஒரு இன்ட்ரெஸ்ட் ரேட் வந்து டென் பர்சன்டேஜ் ஃபார் ஃபைவ் இயர்ஸ் அப்போ இந்த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் இயரில் என்ன வந்துருக்கும் ஹண்ட்ரட் ருபீஸ் த பாண்ட் உட வீல்டு ஹவு மச் இஸ் பேட் தௌசண்ட் ருபீஸ் த ஹோல்டர் ஆஃப் த பாண்ட் இஸ் பேட் ஸோ ஃபர்ஸ்ட் இயரில் ஹவு மச் ஹேஸ் ஈல்டட் ஹண்ட்ரட் அப்போ ஹண்ட்ரட் அப்பான் அ ப்ரைஸ் ஆஃப் தௌசண்ட் இஸ் கோயிங் டு பி டென் பர்சன்டேஜ் ஸோ த பாண்ட் ஹேஸ் ஈல்டட் இம் டென் பர்சன்டேஜ் But the question is, this 10% is exactly equal to the 10% age interest rate. This is not the same thing, but it will not be. Why is yield changing? Yield is changing because a bond holder will not remain with you. 
the person who has bought it at 1000 rupees he is not selling to anyone else throughout its tenure then we can understand that the bond yield will also be 10% but he is going to sell it to someone else so when he is selling let's see just understand or assume that it is being sold at 1100 appo 1100 ku vaangna or sarki maasa maasa 100 rupees will be paid as interest so how much is this yield 9% is the yield for the second person on the other hand let's say it is being sold at 900 a person is going to earn 100 rupee as interest per month per year over a 900 rupee bond so this is going to give him a yield of 11 percent so 10 percentage is the interest rate but the yield is changing on the basis of the price at what price it is sold at after in the correlation that we are clearly able to understand that when the demand for a bond is high demand the price for a bond will be higher isn't it so demand is higher price is higher yield will be lower why the right now if demand is low prices will fall when prices are falling the demand or the yield for it will fall so this is the basis on which we are going to understand operation K. So one what will allow Yahoo to achieve price for a yield for when the price of a bond is decreasing, yield is increasing, when the price of a bond is decreasing, yield will decrease. So this is the understanding which you have to keep in mind. Now let's talk about what we are doing. So this is the yield curve of a 10 year or a long term bond of the company. So what is happening? Since April 2019, the RBA has been cutting interest rates. So let's just imagine 10 percentage from Alona Martin H. Kome. It's a bond or interest rate on the bond. All right, it's being sold again and again. Now, in the repo rate, in the 10 percentage mara the interest rate abey da irukum but when he is selling it to someone else he will demand a higher rate if a higher rate demand pandranaala prices increase aagudhu 1000 rupees illa bond 1100 point ke illa 1200 point in ke paare so when people are buying it at 1100 or 1200 yield is going to fall so when yield is falling it is good for the economy because it follows the rate cut of the rbi so this work happened. Now, since July 2019, there has been some pressure. It has not fallen because the price is not the price is not falling. Now, see, let's not talk about all these curves. Let's talk about this particular point. December 2019. December 2019, what is Throughout this, the entire duration, RB has been cutting interest rates. So this is the event of the Fifth Monetary Policy Committee. Fifth Monetary Policy Committee, I am not going to reduce the repo rates. After repo rate curriculum, the interest on short-term bonds will also not fall. Short-term bonds, it will not fall, isn't it? So when it is not falling, the players, especially banks, financial institutions, are feeling that they can earn better profit on short-term bonds. So long-term bonds la vanga nipadula, short-term bonds le vanga la nipadula. So they are feeling short-term bonds are better because it, the interest rate is not going to fall. At the same time, if you see, in the Madhuri market, market situation is a demand for long term security has been created. Here, immediately upon this, the yield rate of long term bonds began to increase. When will yield increase? When price is falling. 
when will price fall when the demand for the bond is lowered so why has this demand lowered it is because the repo for short term bonds have not been cut down so this is unusual and this is increasing too much it means that long term bonds are the demand for the thing happen so it is here that the rbi said if market is not having a demand for long term security i will ensure it how will i ensure i will buy long term securities so when i buy long term securities i have to put more money inside it isn't it so already there is a surplus of liquidity there is so much of money with banks they don't know what to do they are not able to give it as credit because the economy is falling so whatever liquidity they are having they are trying to invest in government securities and all that other assets so this is not going to help the rbi because if it is going to say i'm going to create a demand for the long term bonds by buying them it has to put more money into the market already there is a liquidity surplus so what should it do it should not change liquidity how will it not change liquidity by simultaneously making purchases as well as sale so yenak theva unda 1000 rupees ku ulle podrunu sonna i will absorb so this is selling buying of when i buy i will put 1000 rupees in there and the 1000 rupees sir i will sell short term securities exactly equivalent to this amount and also so this is going to relate to or going to end up with zero or zero liquidity in the market zero liquidity is going to happen but at the same time what is going to happen the yield curve of the long term of the 10 year or long term securities are going to stabilize and this is what happened when the special market operation was conducted the yield curve which was going to up in this direction began to flatten so this is the objective of oimo in the name of operation twist and remember operation twist is not something very newly discovered by india way back in 2011 and 13 the federal bank of usa also similarly intervened in this part right the next thing regarding monetary policy we spoke about the focus of transition fund so since the fifth monetary policy committee the rbi has been facing a dilemma whether to increase money supply or not increasing money supply will further lead to inflation inflation is also becoming a challenging issue for the rbi so rbi decided to not cut rates so when it is not cutting rates where will money expand in the market because the economy is in need of more money and this is where it said in instead of just traditionally sticking to the point of cutting interest rates i am going to focus more on the transmission of rates for example 135 basis point over the last year entirely 2019 la 135 basis point have been reduced by the rbi but transmission of rates transmission of rates means the rates that have been translated to the people or the end customers by banks have been very low hardly 40 basis points so already nare cut paniyaachu 1.35 point percentage korandirchu repo rate inga 0.4 dhaan korandirchu appo inga rate korakalame instead of just reducing this what to focus idukaga first external benchmark nu oru புது ரேட் சிஸ்டம் கொண்டு வராங்க அதை தொடர்ந்து சிக்ஸ்த் மானிட்டரி பாலிசி கமிட்டி செவன்த் மானிட்டரி பாலிசி கமிட்டியில் லாங் டேர்ம் ரெப்போ ஆப்ரேஷன் அண்ட் மாடிஃபைட் ஆர் டார்கெட்டட் லாங் டேர்ம் ரெப்போ ஆப்ரேஷன் சொல்லி ரெண்டு விதமான நியூ இனிஷியேட்டிவ்ஸ் அப்படி பார்க்கணும் ஸோ வாட் ஆர் தே ஃபர்ஸ்ட் எக்ஸ்டர்னல் பெஞ்ச் மார்க் அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் வி ஹாவ் அ ரெஜிம் கால்டஸ் எம்சிஎல்ஆர் மார்ஜினல் காஸ்ட் பேஸ்ட் லெண்டிங் ரேட் so this is an internal benchmark internal benchmark means the banks are free to decide the interest rates based on their marginal cost it is an internal affair rbi has been saying this is not ensuring 
monetary transmission. So what I'm going to do is, from henceforth, you will shift to a new system called as external benchmark system. So where many level could you benchmark use money, you have to determine what is your interest rate that you are going to give to your customer. So what is on what basis? Either the benchmark I use one repo rate benchmark I use for now, treasury bill or the rate 82, 182 are while 91 day treasury bill are there. Abdilena financial benchmark of India private limited city. There is a website. Our website the for any benchmark you can use. So this is going to bring more transmission if the argument of the RTA. Right. Another part in since 2019 March, uh, April, and this every two months or three months, the RBI has been pushing banks to use EBLR, external benchmark linked loan. Another most of the banks have shifted to repo linked loans, repo matto erkunun nila, yender ekal use kanda, but the preference, predominant preference is repo link. The seventh monetary policy committee made certain important decisions. In the decision, how did it change the entire monetary policy tools? We are going to see. So, the asymmetric corridor from a sorry from a symmetric corridor, we have moved to a asymmetric corridor. So, what is this? Understand? This is the very important thing. Repo rate. 5.15 marginal standing facility rate will be 0.25. Apo konsa adi maatra. So reverse repo rate will be 0.25. Apo there seem to be a symmetry, which is, or we can say repo rate of the key, repo rate key, al tinda poru the evola idhe evolu sige naamle tinda kamuji. Up until the sixth monetary policy committee to break the deal. The seventh monetary policy committee. A special monetary policy committee held on account of COVID. In a Pandana, repo rate Nalla Korcham, all of us in a 75 basis point it has reduced. Normally, they will just reduce it and they will not speak about MSF and reverse repo because it will align accordingly. But this time, the RB has done some unusual step. What is that? It is said either 75 basis point, repo over 75 basis point for second, but reverse repo over 90 basis point for a second. Yeah, in the Mari asymmetry follow on the Right? This is the question. Before looking into the questions that we saw, right? We'll come to that. But other decisions also taken in the seventh monetary policy committee, the COVID-19 carpet editor, and emergency meeting. It will end up on a cash reserve ratio after many years has been lowered from 4 percentage, it has been lowered to 3 percentage. Targeted long term repo operations. I will end up with this one. Then, the MSF load load rate. What is the MSF load? MSF load rate. You have normally a liquidity adjustment facility. Where I will be giving you certain amount of funds in the format of LAF or repo and reverse repo. There is one condition. If you come to me and ask for repo rate or repurchase agreement, you have to give me certain assets or securities which are not part of the SLR. You should not touch or violate SLR norms. Now, if you have no bond with you, if you have no security with you, but you still need a loan from the RBA, you cannot come under the repo rate. You have to come under the marginal standing facility rate for Mongol Bear. Bond day, another repo or on you can touch your SLR security. So, how much can you touch? Up until this moment, it was 2% up to 2 percentage of the security that you are maintaining as part of SLR, you can touch them for borrowing against the MSA. Now it has been increased to 3 percentage to infuse more liquidity this time. Add the 
CCB increase panni irukanga or it has been delayed to march 2020 so adha enna abbi paapom adutha banks will participate in offshore rupee movement in the moon decision no, last month eduthaanga yen eduthaanga so we are going to discuss in detail about this and also this in the coming slide but before going to this we also have to see a little bit on the long term repo approach idu epo first time kondu varanga 6th monetary policy committee february 2020 February Monetary Policy Committee the RBA said I am not going to cut interest rate repo rate cut from that fifth month December new repo rate cut from that so that is the question if you are not cutting down repo rate how will the bank give lower rates to the customer transmission nadakkum nadakkum solrenga eppadi transmission nadakkum the banks are saying see I do not have the capacity of transferring your rate நீங்க ரெப்போவை குறைச்சிங்க ஆனால் ரெப்போ வந்து ரொம்ப கம்மியான டைம் தான் ஸோ ஷார்ட் டேர்மில் தான் எனக்கு ஒரு சின்ன பெனிஃபிட் கிடைக்குது பட் டு கஸ்டமர்ஸ் ஐம் கிவிங் ஃபார் அ லாங் டேர்ம் பர்பஸ் அப்போ லாங் டேர்மில் வேணும்னு சொன்னால் ஃபிக்ஸ்டு டெபாசிட்ஸ் நான் அதிகமான ரேட்டு கொடுக்கணும் ஐ ஹாவ் டு கிவ் ஹையர் சேவிங்ஸ் ரேட் ஒன்லி தன் பீப்புள் வில் டெபாசிட் அதை தான் நான் அதுக்கு கொடுக்க முடியும் ஐம் நாட் டேக்கிங் என்டர் ஃபண்ட் ஃப்ரம் தி ஆர்பிஐ ஸோ ஆர்பிஐ கொடுக்குற ரேட்டை வச்சு ஐ கே நாட் ட்ரான்ஸ்மிட் இட் ஹண்ட்ரட் பர்சன்டேஜ் டு த கஸ்டமர் is the long pending complaint of the bank idu kaagada sorry if you are not able to transfer first ablr kondu vaanga nu sonna right the tax another option i'm going to give you that is long term repo operation so what is this long term repo operation repo nu sonnaale it is for a short term period short term period is for one day and that has been increased to 7 days and the highest that we have is 14 days 14 day repo varaikum na over that's it february la enna pannuvanga this has been increased to 1 year and 3 year so 1 year varaikum repo la loan kadaikkum nu sonna repo nadu the cheap ana rate the cheap ana rate la enna loan kadaikkum nu sonna i can transmit this money to customers is a argument this is the logic behind it march la rbi is the ltr adavad tltr nu solli kondu vandanga seventh monetary policy committee why was it called as a targeted ltr there was a huge liquidity pressure on banks mainly because the stock market was coming crash stock market crash aagudhu many people are selling their money people are selling their bonds they want to exit the country foreign portfolio investments are going outside so when everybody is redeeming their asset redeeming the going giving it to the person for example treasury bill vaangiradana and when are the government to give cash to the people or a corporate bond vaangiradana thirupu kudunga nu kekkuradhu stocks i am selling it to someone else so all of them need money so liquidity pressure is going on so how do you meet the liquidity pressure that is being felt in stock market especially money market capital market la thevai padu money who is going to answer idukaga the government said see if you want money to absorb if you want money to absorb mutual funds if you want money to absorb corporate bonds if you want money to absorb commercial paper alla debentures in the mariana investments ki ungalku cash thevai padu for example there is a person who is saying take this in the bond enak vena na vikka poren enak cash kudunga nu yara ketaanga na adukaga in order to absorb those bond if you need money you can take that money through long term repo operation apo target pannu specifically in order to meet the needs of liquidity pressure in the market and kind of targeted ltr right right as we saw seventh monetary policy committee there were other main decisions taken by the rbi 
first is in the nature of the increasing the SLR securities, eligible SLR securities that can be brought under the MSF to 3 percentage. The second is the expansion of CCD. And the third was related to the stability of Indian rupee or the against dollars. The exchange rate is stabilized from the other. Another move was taken by the RBA and that was related to the offshore rupee derivative. So we are going to study in detail about the CCB as well as offshore rupee derivatives. Right. The CCB, why should it be in delay to September 2020? In the CCB, what is CCB? Capital Conservation Buffer. Capital Conservation Buffer. It was introduced or it is a main tool that was brought about during Basel 3. Basel 3, even the 2008 financial crisis. What did it say? It said that CAR norms, capital adequacy ratio, the norms that came in Basel 1, where financial institutions were required to keep certain amount of their own capital and that was measured through the means of capital adequacy ratio. It was had to be around 8 percentage, which was the safe limit. About 8 percentage was said, no, but despite having 8 percentage, many of the banks were failing and that is why the Basel committee decided we have to bring about a new capital norm and that norm was in the format of capital conservation buffer. Additional or extra capital should be required by banks. If they all are 2.5 percentage of the risk rated assets. RWA and the risk rated assets 2.5 percentage extra were made to them. But under this basal three, there were two norms. One was mandatory, the other was discretionary. But discretionary counter cyclical buffer 2.5 up to 2.5, but the only difference between mandatory and discretionary is that this is applicable for all banks, but this is not. So RBA has adopted Basel Norm 3. Basel 3 adopt from 2015 onwards, we have been adopting Basel 3. Accordingly, all banks in India have to maintain CCB. How much is the CCB? Extra 2.5 percentage of risk rated assets. Discretionary CCB in Salo is not meant for all banks. As of now, the current practice is the RB is allowing this only for D6. Domestically, systemically important banks. There are only three banks in India which are qualified under this category SBA, ICICI, and HDFC. Right? So, this is some basics about capital conservation buffer. Six from 2015 onwards, we said that it has been under implementation. So, 2.5 percentage extra over a year because it is going to be a huge financial strain for banks. So, what happened for implementing Basel 3? The RBA said it is going to do it in a phased manner every year, some percentage. So, what was this percentage? 2.5 percentage divided by 4. In 4 years, you have to maintain this. And so it will end in March 31, 2019. So every year 0 0.625. So every year it was 0 0.625 percentage. 2016, 65, 17, 65, 18, 65, and 19, So in 2018, when the last phase of the CCB was on, there was a crisis around the latter end or October. 2018, the ILFS crisis on no under this, and because of that, banking system was severely impacted. And so, liquidity crisis was there. There were a lot of problems that emanated during those times. And so, taking this problem into consideration, the RBA gave a relief to banks saying, you need not maintain CCB within 2019. You can defer it to 2020. But 2020, March 31 plus, you the last 0.625 maintain in this ocean, you maintain in this ocean. So, this was the decision taken. 
we felt that by 2020-20 the problems will get sorted and banks will be in a position to maintain 2.5 percentage but that didn't happen in 2020-20 also there was a problem especially since january february we have been facing a global onslaught due to this disease outbreak so taking this into consideration in the 7th monetary policy committee in march 2020-20 so within 15 days or within this month you need not maintain that 2.0.65 and this will be delayed to September 2020 this is not final when things are still uncertain there are high chances that will again be deferred right the other main decision taken in the 7th monetary policy committee refers to the offshore rupee delivery see the CCB deadline extend bananala how much has happened 56,000 crore is now extra with banks Right. Offshore rupee derivatives la what decision at the ganga. In the decision at the ganga. See? Yeah. So this is the decision. So regulator, which is the RBA, will now allow banks to trade in the offshore rupee derivatives. So what is this a big deal? Why is this a big deal? Why is this an important thing for consideration right a little bit of basics is to touch upon because people will not be understanding this properly derivatives may end one we know derivatives are part of the capital market where money can be raised or capital can be raised through the means of a derived asset so what is the derived asset an asset which is not having its own value but is having a value upon an underlying asset and this asset could be in the nature of futures it could be forwards it could be options it could be swaps these are the major derivatives that we are dealing with in india at present so anything see understand to be very clear even the rupee that we have is an actually derivative a derivative of the government's promise and the madri any financial asset which is going to derive value upon another asset is called as derivative rombu mukkiyama offshore derivative na enna appadina a derivative already derived na derived from a value for example stock derivative stock derivative means a derivative which is having or which is having its value based upon a stock when this derivative if sold on offshore or outside india la if this derivative is sold that is called as offshore derivative a very important example of this is the p notes p notes or participatory notes is a loan where outsiders foreigners will be given the option of investing in indian stock based on a certificate but the certificate order value in the world is based on an asset so this is a derivative an offshore derivative in the case of offshore rupee derivative in peso for offshore derivative p notes could be based on rupee could be based on dollar but mostly it is based on dollar people will be investing in dollars we will be taking out dollars but the underlying stock is indian stock offshore rupee derivative now everything is being settled or the basis itself is rupee the derivative is on the basis of rupee appo illa enna punjikkano there is a derivative whose value is on rupee appo currency derivative na right the currency derivative eppadi work aagudhu edukkaga in the problem ah ippo nama paakanum right so understand this just imagine a scenario right there is a person a who is a usa based export so he is giving rupees 10000 dollar worth of products to a person b in india b is the importer so today let us say april 2020 he is going to sell this product 
worth rupees ten thousand dollar. He has to pay him certain amount. About how much he has to pay, he will see for just for easy calculation sake. Let us assume that rupees ten per dollar much. So one lakh rupees over could go. April month la one lakh rupees could occur now. He will take this one lakh, convert that into ten thousand dollars. But what if the arrangement is like this? Today I give you products. I am a supplier, and you will pay me after three months. Three months kapro. That is on July la na na pay kapro. How much you should pay? Same. Ten thousand rupees worth na ane ke na de. April la one lakh is the due. One lakh due. One lakh due I will pay in the month of July. But what if in the month of July the rate is rupees eleven? So every dollar is going to be converted as rupees eleven. So when B is paying one lakh rupees to A, when he converts it, he will be only getting nine thousand dollars. So in three months he has faced a loss of thousand dollars. Then the thousand dollars loss, or there is a risk of losing thousand dollar, right? So in order to hedge this risk or offset this risk, we can use derivative. The very purpose of derivative is using, or the objective is to hedge the risk. अब इंगो रिस्क इन्वॉल्ड आय रखे, इन द रिस्क के ये बड़ी कंटेन पना लाओ. Therefore, this person A who is going to face a risk. Is going to go to a person C and is going to say, "If I give you one lakh rupees after three months, promise that you will pay me thousand dollars, or sorry, ten thousand dollars, irrespective of what the rate is. It might be eleven, it might be nine rupees, it could be eight rupees, it could be even twelve rupees. Whatever is the rate in the market." We should not agree on the terms of the market, but this is a agreement between two parties, between A and C. So C here could be an investor. He could be institution. He could be forex dealers. He could be banks or anybody who is having the capacity to generate a lot of money and pay him back. So for this promise, ने ये वो रे मून मास में करो ना उन वन लाख कुड़ के ना पता आयरन कुड़ में केक रंग ला In the promise, kaha April month le some amount will be transferred to this person. And let's say hundred dollars. So hundred dollars or a paper will be exchanged, and this paper is called as the currency forward. And what is the currency that is being used here? Rupee is the currency. So forward is what a derivative. So this is an example of rupee derivative, and when C and when A both are outside India, this could be an offshore rupee derivative. Clear? I hope you are able to understand this. To further go into the detail, see, and let's just imagine that the market scenario is rupees eleven. अपो इबर वंदे टेन थाउजेंड डॉलर्स और नो पर्सन ए हैज रिसीव्ड वन लाख रुपीस एंड ही इज गोइंग टू ट्रांसफर इट टू सी सी हैज टू पे हिम टेन थाउजेंड डॉलर्स एस प्रॉमिस सो इज गोइंग टू फेस अ लॉस ऑफ हंड्रेड हंड्रेड थाउजेंड डॉलर्स सो थाउजेंड डॉलर्स इज हिज लॉस अना ऑलरेडी हंड्रेड डॉलर्� In the matter, complex ah, taking one lakh, converting this into dollar, again he converting. इधर क्या बोले ना सुलवा ना three months का परों अंदर rate आ पाम. If according to the rate he is going to face a thousand dollar loss, he will transfer thousand dollars to A. He will not take one lakh rupee. अंदर one lakh rupee हमारे बड़ी मार्ची अंदर माले तो पना बता रहे. He will take. He will just transfer. Thousand dollars to this person. That's it. So even though the underlying asset is rupee, the settlement is after three months. The settlement is on the basis of 
dollars. If this is happening in India, we could have easily settled in rupee. But this because everything is happening abroad, it is settled in dollars. This kind of a market in the or conflict arrangement, this market began to develop outside, especially in places like London and Singapore. Right? Anala even the offshore market in Singapore. So London, Singapore are becoming major offshore market where emerging currencies like Korean won, Brazilian real and Indian rupee are being sold and bought. Right? So there has been an expanding market for Indian rupee derivative. So this means that rupee is becoming globalized or we can say rupee is being traded across the border. So the volume of the trade, how much is it? So there is a rupee derivative based in India that is called as onshore derivative. Rupee derivative based outside India that is called as offshore derivative. Why is it a concern? See, in the chart at the bottom, you can know the concern. See, in 2014-15, compare how much is the offshore, how much is the offshore. Onshore, nearly 63% of all rupee derivatives are based on onshore. Slowly, it is with this increase. As it increases, in 2018, for the first time in India, we felt that a rupee derivative, the volume of rupee derivative was very high outside India than in India. So this was a concern for RBI and it said if this is going to happen, when things are going to happen like this, when the share of onshore is going to decrease, what implication does it have on Indian currency? Please study. Either study Pandavita, Usha Thorat Committee was formed. So even Enna Pandana. Right? So this task force was set up to examine the issue. So how to ensure stability of value, how to incentivize, whether we have to bring or make NRI exchange rupee or dollar. Foreign exchange la pannama, ulla pannama. These questions were made before task force. In the task force, some recommendations were given. It said Indian banks should not be allowed to deal in offshore rupee derivative market. Rather, if you feel that offshore dominance is going higher, make onshore dominance. How to ensure onshore dominance? By improving the access. Allow norms. Liberalize certain norms. Make more people buy your onshore rupee derivatives. Permit Indian banks to operate round the clock, 24 bar 7. In India, 9 to 10 the work out the payment systems. After that, everybody is going to sleep. But outside London, Europe market, USA market, the day timings are completely different. So around the clock, allow these to happen. And it even said, if at all you want some share of offshore market, allow those offshore derivatives in the International Financial Service Center, the only international financial center that we have in India is the gift city. These were some of the recommendations given by the Usha Thorat Committee. So why is this offshore rupee derivative expanding? We should understand that we do not have a full capital account convertibility. We don't have a full capital account convertibility. Right? This is a reason. So based on this recommendation and also seeing the situation that a lot of foreign portfolio investors are exiting the market, especially due to the stock market crash in March 2020, the regulator RBI said, okay, there is not going to be a huge onshore derivative market in India, especially due to the crisis situation. But there, if at all, there is going to be an offshore demand. I am going to allow my Indian banks also to participate in it. So this will allow a stability of rates for 
Indian rupee. The volatility can be curbed. The exchange rate can be stabilized. This is what the RB is doing. Right? The next topic that we are going to discuss is about the Shipping Finance Commission whose period is starting from 2020. So, about Finance Commission, you would know. Article 2 A&D mandates that the President should constitute Finance Commission every five years and they should have certain mandates as to settle the question of how the proceeds have to be distributed between center and state. Or to be precise, it is going to deal with the question of horizontal devolution of taxes, vertical devolution of taxes. So what is the vertical devolution? The 14th Finance Commission had increased the vertical devolution. Vertical devolution is from center to states. It said from 32 percentage, you have to increase it to 42 percentage. And so there was obviously a question before the 15th Finance Commission saying, are you going to increase it further? So there was no room for increasing it beyond that level. What has happened as of now is, it has decreased it to 41 percentage. 41 percentage decrease, Manila, it is not actually a decrease, it is actually a status quo. Why this has been decreased to 41 percentage to states? Because one large state, Jammu Kashmir, has been converted into a union territory. So, in the previous finance commission, its share was 1 percentage. So, in the 1 percentage share, I had share 41 percentage. So, this is vertical devolution, but there has been changes in the horizontal devolution. The 41 percentage is so, one controversy about this Finance Commission's terms of reference. I want you to study the terms of reference. Just go through the list one by one. Just a quick reading will do. One reference is the population reference. Why did it cause concern among certain states? Because it said 2000. 11 census used for the 2011 census instead of 1971 census which means population will be given more weightage so in 1971 Tamil Nadu had a, had a higher share of population but now due to its efforts of bringing down population in 2011 the share of population has dropped so pay, pay, States like Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Kerala, Karnataka are saying, are you punishing us because we have decreased the population? So, is this argument true? We have to discuss now. Right? Just look at the criteria for devolution. Compare it to 14th and 15th finance commission. So, what are the main criteria that is being used? One, population criteria. In 14th finance commission, we had used both, but greater weightage was given to 1971. In 15th Finance Commission, no reference to 1971. Everything has to be taken from 2011. Only 15 percentage weightage has been given to population. But there are other areas in which the concerns of these better performing states have been addressed. Every Pandit Gangana, one, forest cover. Last time it was 7.5, it down it has been increased to 10 percentage. Then the new category has been introduced this year. One is demographic performance, the other is tax effort. So what is demographic performance? Demographic performance now, how well is your population indicators? The population correlation is in here. Many of the states are saying that you are punishing us. No, it is actually not. Even though there is a disadvantage of using population 2011, I am going to give you certain other advantages. One advantage is democratic performance. For example, total fertility rate. Total fertility rate. Fertility rates, if the population has dropped, it obviously means that the fertility rates have come down. So, 12 percentage on demographic performance. Say, there is a state which is having 20 crore and its fertility rate is 4. 
there is another state whose population is just 10 crore and its fertility rate is just 2. If we just see mere population, it may as though seem that this uh, state which is having 20 crore is going to benefit and this state is going to fall out. Not so. When you take demographic performance, this will also become 5. This will also become 5. So there is a parity or we can say the lower the total fertility rate or the demographic performance, you will have higher weightage in this area. Tax effort. Tax effort means how much of your own taxes you have raised. So better performing tax uh, states will have better tax effort. So they will also be given this incentive. So demographic performance, tax efforts, forest, all these areas are clearly going to balance out any disadvantage that states are facing due to the consideration of 2011. Right? So, another controversial terms of reference was the elimination of revenue deficit grant. So, grant is something which the government or government has to compulsorily give to the state. So, every year there has been a practice of the finance commission saying that you have to transfer certain amount of your taxes as revenue deficit grant. There is going to be a revenue deficit for states and this revenue deficit is because of the unequal distribution of tax resources. So this deficit has to be paid through in the means of grant. If they eliminate Pani Lama, this was also a term of reference, but the finance commission has not eliminated it. Rather, it has said there should be Many states are being at disadvantage, especially Karnataka, Kerala. These are states at a disadvantage. You have to give them revenue deficit. So, no false question of eliminating revenue deficit grants. Along with that, it has said special grants for Karnataka, Mizoram, Telangana should be given. Sector specific grants from henceforth, sector specific, over sector, nutrition, health. Education in the Mari sector specific a grant will have to be given to states. Performance based grants should also be given, local body grant. And for disaster risk management, it proposes two new funds. One, the National Disaster Management Fund, Management Fund, which is very important. Management Fund. Already we have is NDRF and SDRF. What are the National Disaster Response Fund? So, this fund will kick in only after the onset of a disaster. Response Kara Matana. Here, the Finance Commission is saying management fund start on the lines of NDRF and SDRF. This will promote mitigation. Varumun Kapumbai. Mitigation of risk. Right. This is uh, this is all the things that we should understand about the terms of reference and the recommendations of Finance Commission. Understand the full recommendation of the Finance Commission has not been tabled yet. Only for one year it has been given. For the next four years, we are I can say that by the end of this year we will get the full report. Now. We are going to discuss a little bit about certain tax amnesty schemes. Two tax amnesty schemes during the period of our discussion, that is from June 2019 to March 2020, we have two tax amnesty schemes given out by the government. One is the Sabka Vishwas scheme. So this was proposed in July 2019. Budget and the budget la the what is this? This is related to service tax and central excise tax or we can say indirect tax, especially GST. In the end, tax amnesty. So, any dispute that you have, for example, the government, you would have paid certain amount of taxes to the government on your class, on your calculation. But the government would be saying, no, you are wrong. 
tax officials ungalku oru summon report anipirpaanga that you have to pay extra 1 crore appo ninga enna panuvinga illa i will not pay so this is the disputed amount so you will see in the court tribunals la paakala tax tribunals la paakala nu solli this will be pending for resolution all those resolution all those disputed taxes will be resolved under this scheme especially this is not a direct tax scheme this is a indirect tax scheme there will be complete amnesty people who are coming under this roof under sabka vishwas if you say i am i am not going to further prolong this dispute settle panniralam sonningna idukku mela no prosecution on the dispute amount full waiver of interest penalty and fine fines penalty interest ella edhume kedaiyadhu whatever is the disputed amount only that you have to pay the period was from for this last year so what kind of relief is available so duty demand duty demand means what is the demand of the government and what is disputed so if it is in the appeal area already there has been an order and it is being in the appeal it is been on the appeals court or appeals tribunal so now if it is below 50 lakh only 70 percentage of that amount you should pay to the government if it is above 50 lakh you can pay just 40 50 percentage if there has been cases where no appeal is pending no appeal just for the first time so na 60 percentage for the relief 40 percentage for this relief case illa you have not disclosed properly ipo da vandu neenga disclose pandreenga income tax end action edukla inimail edukkadukana vaippu irukku but you are saying see there has been a mistake on my side so i have to pay this much amount neengala vandutinga so na you have to pay the full amount right you have to pay the full amount so this is the scheme this is the tax amnesty scheme sabka vishwas there is another scheme called as the vivaksha vishwas scheme then a vivaksha vishwas scheme this was in 2020 20 budget la nama potha this is similar to this scheme sabka vishwas scheme the only difference is this is a direct tax scheme so corporation taxes income taxes whatever is a tax if, if it is any dispute pending before tribunal or courts or under adjudication you can pay it until march 31 2020 2020 there will be no interest no penalty complete amnesty against any income tax proceedings so you will not be harassed by income tax officials the law will not come after you just pay it if at all you are not able to pay it before this time 10 percentage penalty will be attracted after 31 until this scheme is in operation this vivatse vishwas right so what this scheme which was to expire by march 31 2020 has been extended to june 2020 june 2020 because of the covid the covid prachana nala june 2020 varaiku you can this rewards a vishwas scheme has been extended right now other topics we have something called as the national statistics office so coso was the dominant player as far as statistics is concerned in india now slowly we are able to find a difference in the terminology that is nso last year in march 2019 the government made the decision of merging two entities under the mosfi ministry of statistics killer two agencies are there one is the nsso and the cso nsso is mainly related to certain service cso has its own functions for example gdp class uh, calculation inflation class calculation in the mari household survey expenditure survey uh, income survey in the mari surveys ella nsso pannuvanga government decided to merge this into nso 
one of the reasons for it was a contradiction between CSO and NSSO. In 2018, GDP related issues were contradicted. So, statistics area lay or incredibility problem. So, we have to sort out this problem as soon as problem as soon as possible and that's why the NSO was formed in order to bring better coordination and homogenization. So as of now, survey, the knowledge divisions is there under the NSO, data processing, survey, field operations and FDR. Seventh economic census 2019. What is this? Economic census. Understand, economic census is nowhere related to the population census. It is from 1991 onwards that we embarked on the process of seventh economic census. Till now, we don't have any time frame. We can do this. The non form economic activities is the main area of expertise is to understand how employment is organized, how occupation is managed, especially non-form activities. So it will give us location-wise economic activities, how activities are dispersed, geographically distributed across India, what kind of occupation is giving better prospects, and then the area is inactive, which is not giving any worker relief, understand to understand the dynamics of employment, we need to have economic census. Why is this economic census? In 2017, the Niti IO task force said we have to improve employment data. As of now, the employment data is critically short in India. So we need a periodic employment data from other means in order to strengthen this. We have to periodically assess or bring forth the economic census. So every three years from henceforth, from seventh economic census, every three years, the government should embark on an economic census, which will give us information on how establishments are available, how the various non-form categories are managed and organized. Or we can say, or business register prepare for the government, it will be helping us. Sixth, sixth economic census, 2013, it said that nearly under the finding, 13 crore people are employed under other non-form establishments. Let's see, see, 10 ke kila in the informal silo below 10. So, this is the area. In the area kula, both in form as well as in non-form, how much of the percentage is there? In agriculture, nearly 99 percentage of the population is having below 10. In non-agricultural, non-form activities, it is coming to nearly around 97 to 98 percent. So, this is one of the structural problems in India. Nearly 90 percentage, 99 percentage of the agricultural and non agricultural establishments in India are catering at a level of or informal basis. Remember, Kamiyana workforces that they are working. Right? So, seventh, how much of the establishments are there? What is the growth rate? How much are employed? What is the growth rate? Is there something which the government can do? It will understand it will be helpful. That's why the seventh economic census is being conducted as of now. Other thing related to statistics is the National Statistics Commission. What is this commission? We do not have a separate body or a regulator for statistics regulation in India. That's why the Rangarajan Committee in 2005 came up with the idea of having a separate National Statistics Commission as an autonomous body. So this was formed 
and this will evolve policies, priorities, all those things. As of now, this has been formed on the basis of executive resolution. Government has just formed it on the basis of executive resolution. It has no statutory backing, nothing. So, NSC, National Statistics Commission, or a chairperson, and other members who have specialization and experience in statistics. So, who are these four, five, six members? One, Niti Ayogoda, chairman is the ex official member, and other, Bimal Kumar Roy is the chairperson. This is the National Statistics Commission. In this body, this body, up until 2020, three years ago, the government has recently extended the tenure of these people. Right. There was a bill that was passed in 2019 related to National Statistics Commission. So as you understand, the National Statistics Commission is not a statutory body. There is no law backing it. So in order to give statutory backing, the National Statistics Bill 2018 was passed. So what does it propose? Certain important proposals which I understand. It changes the composition of the National Statistics Commission. It says there will be somebody called as the Chief Statistician of India who will head the National Statistics Commission. Understand? NSO under our body and our form under the head of the NSO will be called as the Chief Statistician of India. So he is also going to head the National Statistics Commission. He will have chairman and also members from other important regulators. RB Deputy Governor will be there. Chief Economic Advisor will have a place. He will have certain changes to the composition. Right? So this is what we see. The CSI will now be a member of the National Statistics Commission. So there will be an audit also where statistics audit will be conducted. These are some proposals given under the National Statistics Commission. The next issue that we are going to discuss is the PLFS and the NSSO employment survey findings. So PLFS has been in the news for all the reasons. The reason is the 45 year high. The 45 year high employment data. So unemployment is at a 45 year high. Nearly 6 percentage is unprecedented in the history of Indian economy. But both the government, the statistics department and the economic survey have been critical of this media report. It has said media has just taken this at face value. No need to compare the PLFS finding with the NSSO survey. So what is this PLFS? Is what we are going to do. PLFS was never conducted in the history of India. Employment as of now was on the basis of NSSO's employment survey. Either one the employment, unemployment survey in Sulwanga, once in five years it will be conducted. The last time it was conducted was in 2011-12. So the next survey had to be conducted in 2017. 2017. There were many shortcomings to the NSSO employment survey. The methodology was proving to be inefficient. It was not capturing many dynamic elements. And that's why there was a task force which said we have to revamp the whole idea of capturing employment. That's why in 2017 it said, I'm going to employ a new methodology or a new survey and that will be called as the PLFS. Periodic Labor Force Survey and unlike the five once in five year survey of EUS, this is going to be an annual affair. PLFS survey. In the PLFS survey methodology la finalized the first report came in 2019. So 2018 order employment data came in 2019. In the data, the 41 year old high. To understand this further, we should understand, to remember these terminology, current weekly status, usually status, usual status, unemployment rate, L LFPR, worker population ratio, these are certain terminologies that you should understand related to 
employment data in India. The current weekly status and usual status ki NRP. So usual status further can be classified into principal status, subsidiary status, current weekly status, usual status and NRP. Current weekly status means trying to capture employment on the basis of asking this question. What question? Have you been employed at least one hour in a week? If it is yes, it means that you are employed. No, no, unemployed. No. Usual status now, at least for 30 days in a year, 30 days in a year, have you been employed? On this basis, they will be finding usual status. So, current weekly status is likely to give a more dynamic understanding than usual status. If you logically try to construct it, understanding unemployment on the basis of these both categories are going to lower or underestimate unemployment. But still, we do not have any other alternative as of now. So what does the PLFS do? One PLFS intends to have quarterly survey at the urban level based on weekly status. Over warum poi in the waro ungal ku vela irundha one hour kaadu then this question is going to be asked and on the basis every quarter there is going to be a plfs data for urban based on usual status based on usual status they will be finding annual unemployment data both at the urban and rural so this is going to stop or plug in the gap that we have for understanding unemployment data statistics in India. So, in the basis of the 2017-18 year, what is the usual status unemployment rate? All over India, rural urban the rate was as high. In the 2011-12 unemployment survey of the NSSO, it is around 1.9 percentage. So, this has been high. So, whatever be the comparison, even though there is an advantage of the PLSS that it captures more data, we have to understand or acknowledge the fact that unemployment is still a major problem in India. And also, there is a small or a slight emphasis on the PLSS data. It, it is going to give weightage for those who are above 15 years and also those who have at least completed secondary education. This is the main difference between PLFS and EEM. The unemployment and employment survey of the NSSO is not going to ask the question of whether you have studied or not. But what do you do? If, for example, in a household there are four members, two of them are above 15 years. One of them is illiterate, has not studied anything. The other one, the son, is literate. Under the survey, it is going to find, the under the PLFS survey, it is going to ask the question, are you employed? So if person one is going to say, yes, I am employed, and he has not been, he has not have had, so this PLFS survey, it is also going to ask the question of education. So, as we saw in the discussion, if there is person 1 who is illiterate and person 2 who has completed secondary education, if both of them, if one person who is illiterate has not, he, he is working, he has employment, but the person B who has completed secondary education but is not finding unemployment, so, how to assess the employment situation of this household? So, in this PLFS, it is going to give more weightage to the one who is not only above 15 years, but also who has completed secondary education. So, naturally, it is going to come say that only 75 or instead of 2, it will say only 1.5 of them are employed. Right? So some findings of the PLFS, it finds that nearly 6.1% are unemployment in India, 
nearly 17 percentage of the unemployed are in the young age that is 15 to 29 like the only hope or the only promising thing that we get from this findings is that formalization of jobs has increased so there are a lot of study on this and also an assessment of the PLSS survey in the economic survey as well right those are interested can also read this next we are going to deal most importantly with the RBA's prudential framework for the resolution of stressed assets this is called as the June 2019 circular so what is this about you have to understand a little bit of February 12 circular also February 12 2018 circular is a circular of the RB which said that you should not give even a day relief to those who are defaulting or it said anybody who is becoming an NPA on day one which is 90 days if he has defaulted on the very first day you have to announce that he is a defaulter and you have to send notices to that there is no more restructuring as of now no restructuring in the sense there is no option of using certain restructuring schemes such as s4 asdr 5 by 25 rule etc so it has taken away all restructuring and it has forced the banks to make a defaulter come under the insolvency bankruptcy code or we can say if anybody is becoming a defaulter he has no option but the court but the bank has to initiate certain resolution process against him and the most important resolution mechanism available of India as of now is the IBC so this was the consequence of the February 12 circular most of the banks as well as the corporate borrowers were also finding that the February 12 circular is very hard on them and they were going to the court for some kind of relief the court around march 20, 2019 ruled that the february 12 circular is invalid it said that you cannot force a bank or a company to compulsorily come under the ibc there should be certain amount of freedom or space in which he has to resolve his own problems without coming under the law so this is completely contradictory to our constitutional guarantee of right to trade and commerce so you cannot force somebody to come under insolvency or bankruptcy when he has other options so this was the ruling of the court so based on this ruling the RBA came out with a new circular and that was called as the prudential framework for resolution of stress assets how to resolve stress assets now because the February 12 circular is squashed so under this there are important points given by the RBA the first is it says you have to report early recognition of large borrowers especially before only after 90 days they are becoming NPA but before 90 days there is going to be a new classification that is called as the SMA classification special mention account so if for 30 days a borrower has not paid any amount you should not wait for 90 days you should flag that account or borrowed amount as SMA1 or SMA0 SMA0 likewise there is SMA2 SMA1 so this is the SMA classification this is compulsory as of now and any loans above 5 crore has to be disclosed under the CRI LC this is a repository that has been formed by the RBA mainly to disclose large loans information and it also gave complete discretion to lenders to how the resolution plans would be because now that but the question comes because the uh, a supreme court has taken away the february circular which said that there is no not going to be any restructuring scheme is the restructuring scheme going to make a comeback the rba said no we are not going to again revive the existing schemes all the schemes that have been rendered invalid by the february 12 circular will remain so 
but you have a discretion without using x 4 a SDR 5 by 25 you can use any resolution plan that you are comfortable with and most importantly it gave importance to something called the inter-creditor agreement where many of the borrowers uh, many of the creditors will come together form a platform and they will agree to what is the best resolution plan understand inter-creditor agreement or other resolution plan are before going to the IBC. So what is the difference between this circular and the February 12 circular? The existing, the space outside IBC was not present for R for banks due to the February 12 circular, but now there is a space. So this is the difference. And other important points, if you have to see one is in the form of the additional provisioning system. If at all there is going to be a delay in the resolution plan, you have to provide extra. Till now it was only 10 percentage. Now you have to provide 20 percentage extra. So this is going to enable the banks or to be more effective in the resolution plan. Right? So these are certain reforms that have been part of the prudential framework for resolution of stress assets and fees. The PM Garib Kalyan Yojana Package. So this is the name that is being given by the government to all fiscal stimulus package that the government is coming up in the wake of COVID-19. So this is the financial package. Understand? There is already a Garib Kalyan Yojana which was announced in 2017. That was an income disclosure scheme. Don't confuse that with this. This package is mainly towards all proposals or initiatives taken by the government, mainly for the well-being of the economy and also to ensure business continuity or that Indian society as such is not going under, undergoing any adverse problems due to this lockdown period. So what is the package? If you know, first emphasis was on the insurance cover. The package was around worth 1.7 lakh crores. The insurance coverage has been given to all healthcare workers. Healthcare workers doesn't necessarily mean just the nurses and the doctors. It refers to all ward boys, all administrative personnel, everybody who is involved and even the ones who are providing sanitation work. Any of them or who has the possibility of contracting corona by rendering the services, they will be given an insurance card. Free pulses will be given for the next three months. Along with that, 5 kg wheat and 1 kg pulses will also be given free to each household. Under the PM, under the AI Yojana. So these are certain initiatives taken also to ensure that farmers are having enough liquidity money the government the R, uh, pm kisan under the pm kisan scheme rupees 2000 has been straight away credited or front loaded into the accounts of the farmers lpg cylinders will be given free manrega wages have been increased so these are all part of the fiscal stimulus package and also to ensure that there is business continuity or continue, continuation of employment. The government has said that the PF contributions by the employer and the employee will now be completely taken care of by the government for the next three months. The employer also need not pay, the employee also need not pay. One major criticism with this is that this is very, very slow or we can say this amount is very very small compared to the two trillion american package isn't it so when this two trillion is nearly 10 percentage of their gdp why not india also come up with such an amount so 1.7 lakh crore is not even one percentage the entire three three point three percentage of 
GDP, which is the fiscal deficit. Government is borrowing itself is nearly to the tune of 7 lakh crore. So, government should borrow more is the argument of others and economists as well. And we just have to wait and see how much is the package. So, this is not the final package. The government will also provide other packages. So, one thing is sure for this year. We cannot maintain fiscal deficit targets. Right? How things are going to be in the coming months, we should just wait and see. And finally, we are going to see about a small scheme called as the Nirvik scheme meant for export credit insurance. This is an export credit insurance scheme. Previously, the government was providing under the export credit insurance scheme, was providing up to 60 percentage of insurance. Up, up to, it was covering nearly 60 percentage loss for all the exporters, both the principal and the interest, whatever it is. If at all they are going to face a loss, up to 60 percentage will be provided under the previously existing insurance scheme. This behind, under the new Nirvik scheme, the export credit insurance scheme, what has happened? The coverage has been increased to nearly 90 percent. For all credit guarantees, any loss on the credit guarantees, the insurance will be provided up to 90 percent of the loss. And this loss will also be for both post and pre-export losses. So, after export any loss, before export any losses, everything will be covered. So, this is one of the schemes that has been included under the budget and also last year it came, but this budget made sure that this is going to be final and it's going to be for exporters and also going to reduce the premium. Right? So, with this we will end this session. Thank you.